Great to see all of you here today. Um, I was looking for some sun. Uh, I'm one of those people who always gets hit by the cold weather and not ready right uh, exactly for the transformation. So um, I've been looking for the lights in the room, and I think we finally found them. Thanks all for coming. Uh, Try to figure out what would be the best method, you know, to do a kind of global uh, Drexel sum up. We've actually been in this office, Office of International Programs, uh, for a number of years. Uh, it's o a little over eight years since we actually began, uh, almost actually nine years since we began the Office of International Programs. It's hard really to believe it. Uh, before that, Drexel really didn't have a central office of international programs. And um, one of our previous provosts came and was completely shocked that we didn't have a centralized office. We had a study abroad, but at that time, study abroad was in the Honors College, and it was small. Uh, we had faculty going and doing their own research abroad. But we really didn't have a central office that brought people together, that created a kind of atmosphere on campus and a commitment to internationalization, which so many other universities had. Now, we had a lot of other things going for us, and we had some exciting programs in our faculty research and our education, and we had co-op. But that's something we didn't have. So this provost. He uh, met me, I was director of international area studies at the time, and a group of us, some people who are sitting here, uh, wrote a white paper to the interim provost before that, suggesting that we needed to have some sort of centralized office for international. And uh, so when I met him as director of international area studies, he said to me, well, you know, why don't you have something at Drexel? That's really strange. He had come from the University of Michigan and had been the dean of engineering where they're extremely oriented toward the global. And so uh, I said to him, well, we may not have it, but we all want it and we know that we need it. <laughs> and so he said, okay, great. Uh, and about a week later, he asked me if I wanted to create it. Now, I said to him, well, gee, I'm finishing a book. Could I do it as soon as I finish the book? And he said, okay. And for the next couple months, every week, he asked me if I was ready. But what's important, <laughs> that was funny, but what's important is that it was written into the 2007-2012 strategic plan to create the infrastructure to allow us to take advantage to, of a uh, global engagement and increased internationalization on college campuses. And so we became part of that strategic plan. We created the space and began to do, create the infrastructure necessary to really have a vibrant program on campus. We began then with programming, with yeah, uh, all kinds of international activities but also to reach out to faculty and to provide resources for faculty uh, to be able to be more visible internationally and to engage in research with partners across the university. So that just gives you an idea, I think, of how far we've come since that time and now how much of an integral part global is across the university. And of course, that's because we have stakeholders in various different offices across the campus and many faculty, students, and staff who are uh, engaged and committed. I just want to say a few words about the moment. I think that all of us are wondering what is going to happen to university commitments to international, to internationalization, to global citizenship in the sort of new air of um, uh, the Trump administration, or a new air in which some people are looking inward, uh, a new isolationism in some people's words. I believe that the universities are strongly committed to a global engagement 
This is who we are. Universities, the notion of a university, has from its very start at the University of Bologna been a place where students from all over came together to share ideas and engage in knowledge production. Even then, it was to meet pressing needs, and certainly we have enormous global challenges in front of us, and we recognize that we can only meet those challenges if we come together. And so I think that more than ever, the university must be the welcoming space for people from all over. Universities must be the bridges for nations and peoples to come together over common values and shared challenges and opportunities. And that we really need to think about how we can continually make our space a welcoming one for all peoples on a place where our students and our faculty can have the resources to build the lasting, mutually beneficial relationships that are so necessary to our world today. So I think that ever more important that we think about our university as a global one, and we think about how we, as faculty, as staff, as students, can make the place welcoming, can make the place inclusive, can see the creative, boundless spaces here um, for engagement with people of all kinds, to celebrate diversity, and to really be and train our students, encourage our students to be citizens, global citizens of this world today and tomorrow. So, uh, a little, I won't say anything more on this. Some of you know me, I'm a political scientist. I write on issues of citizenship and sovereignty, so you can just imagine how I could drone on about that for a long time. Uh, won't do that today. I'll look for another forum for that. Um, but I do want to talk about the achievements we have and some of the exciting things, I think, that are happening at, at Global Drexel. Actually, in this room today, we have a number of the real stakeholders of Global Drexel, from our Office um, of en uh, Enrollment Management and Student Success, where we really look to the world as our space for bringing students and sending students uh, at all levels, to our study abroad office, our English Language Center, um, our, who am I missing, our faculty, our global studies, our fellowships office, our advisors, our alumni offices, so many others who are here, part of this, who work together to make Global Drexel. And um, so uh, I'm very excited to have all of you here. So I'm just going to say a few words of the directions that we've moved in, where I think we have um, some exciting uh, opportunities, and then we're really going to open it up for questions. So the idea is to give people a chance to ask the questions you have, um, and for if I can't answer them, we have a lot of representatives here who might be able to answer those questions as well. So um, a few words about our purpose. The Office of International Programs has was created, as I said, first in the uh, um, strategic plan of 2007-2012, to create the infrastructure necessary to take advantage of international opportunities. And so the office has as its mission to work with faculty, students, staff, administrators um, across the university to build opportunities. Opportunities for research platforms, for study, um, innovation, service, and, um, and co-op abroad to make sure that we have the partnerships that are necessary to build a vibrant global space at our university. Now, when we began to build the office, at the very beginning, we looked at different models and realized, given Drexel's resources, given where we were, at the time of building in uh, uh, other universities in internationalization, um, looking at where we hope to be going, what our 
basic values and commitments were, we decided that Drexel would launch a partnership model of global engagement. We had taken some steps, as you know, along the way uh, to build uh, networks and campuses in other places, and we were very hesitant of putting bricks and mortar in any way into our international. We didn't have the resources for that, our faculty is thin, and we had a lot of other areas where we were building. We also had a deep commitment to the notion of mutually sustainable partnerships. And so we focused on creating a partnership model that would link us to selected partner universities in strategic corners of the world. And so we began with four areas, with China, with Israel, with Turkey, and um, uh, Chile slash Brazil, southern cone of Latin America. We did that based upon where we saw the emerging markets and where we had the connections, the faculty, and alumni to leverage to build those partnerships. So most of you know it's not a good idea to go somewhere cold and sort of say, hey, I want to be friends with you. So that's why it was so important that we thought of, you know, where could we leverage our faculty ongoing research? Where could we leverage our alumni relationships? Where could we build upon our strengths as a university? Um, the synergies we could build and the complementary areas of, of our capacities. And so we picked those strategic regions and then we looked to building really sustainable relationships uh, where we could then create collaboration for student opportunities and mobility, for faculty research and mobility, and to increase our alumni connections and our outreach in general, and then hopefully also to create the kind of brand that would help us in recruiting outstanding undergraduates and graduate students. Uh, so that's where we began. And at first, you know, it meant a lot of nurturing, a lot of outreach, and we were lucky that we were able to establish some extremely strong partnerships and that with President Fry's arrival on campus, we had resources behind us to be able to put some seed money into research projects and travel of faculty and students so that this could become a reality. I must say that President Fry's arrival was critical to us because he put International into his inaugural address, which gave us great visibility. And then through all of our work, and many of you were engaged in the task force around the strategic plan, Global became a part of the six uh, initial uh, strategic initiatives. And so uh, make, enhancing our global impact became a strategic initiative. And this was really critical, and it embraced the areas that we consider really important, those areas of experiential learning. And this then provided resources for that, particularly for resources for co-op, so that co-op could build its international um, opportunities. And they've done a fantastic job. Um, and if people have questions, there are people from the co-op office, I believe, here. So um, then we enhanced the work of our study abroad office and really increased our exchange partnerships, our uh, targeted provider programs, and then began to think about how we could innovate to create more opportunities for our students. For faculty, the first one of the first things we did was to create an international travel award. How many faculty members have gotten the international? A lot of faculty have gotten international travel awards and graduate students. Because from my own experience, I remember that you could get grants for a lot of things, but one of the hardest ones to get money for was for travel to conferences. We could not be visible if we were not presenting at conferences. And a thousand dollars goes a long way in helping one get tickets to go abroad. So these were the kinds of things we tried to do. We inaugurated the very, very first year within some months of opening the office. 
our student conference on global challenges, which is a wonderful way for students to come together on campus to be able to um, engage in on themes of critical importance to us in meeting these challenges that confront us all. And students have looked at everything from food and sustainability to infrastructure and gender to really bring their ideas to the forefront and engage with one another. So that we then had cross-country conversations and a number of other programming opportunities important um, for students and faculty. I think some of the most important things were our collaborations with our partners in China and Israel on joint research uh, activities, and we have some enormous successes on those collaborations, which I hope continue through publications and, um, and uh, through continued research funding. That's, of course, a key to that. When we did assessment, and assessment has been key as we moved along, everything we've done we've assessed to make it better in the future. When we did assessment of our uh, ITAs and our seed funding for faculty, we found that there were significant outcomes in terms of publications, visibility, uh, invitations to further conferences, and further funding. And of course, that's the kind of thing that we want to see. So as we grew, we also began to grow in areas. So based upon faculty, fun, uh, faculty research and student area interest, uh, growing numbers of students coming from certain places, we then added on Korea as one of our important countries and some exciting things happening there with nanotechnology, collaboration with KAIST and the NanoFab Center and our top universities in Korea and our student exchanges there and um, uh, building in, Ch in uh, Chile and, and Brazil, particularly in Chile, is getting stronger. Uh, and uh, perhaps some areas have, will change as we, get, as we gain greater strengths, for instance, in the UK in, in, or Italy, and perhaps as turmoil in the world may make some countries le less accessible. But we continue to build those partnerships. And then to think about areas in which we're growing as a university, like entrepreneurship. So in the last visits we made abroad, we included the Dean of Entrepreneurship, and we found that everywhere people were excited about what Drexel was doing. They wanted our expertise, and we've already sent people from our close school to do workshops abroad and to bring in this as one of the signature areas of Drexel. All of the dares now, we are sending out to our collaborators with the idea that these can be areas in which um, Drexel's uh, research uh, areas of excellence can also be areas for collaboration. Now I want to mention a couple other things and then open it up to questioning. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was is that one of the things that we found as we, um, as we were doing, you know, trying to get students to go abroad and study abroad is such an exciting and important part of students' experience, we found that our curriculum is really tough. I mean, we know, no one else has a calendar like we do, no one. And you know, with co-op, which is fabulous, uh, we don't have winter intercession, you know, a month when people go abroad. We don't have summer vacations. So we had to think about how could we give students an opportunity to go abroad when, um, when we have a difficult calendar. And so one of the things we did was to come up with the notion of the intensive course abroad, which has really caught on like wildfire. So using those intercessions, be they very short, but connecting them to course co and course credit so that students can get three credits by doing something in an intercession has really created opportunities, not just for the students, but for faculty. And a number of faculty in here have done ICAs, which is so exciting because you can go to a part of a world where you want to explore or where you have partners and bring your students and engage them in a way that they might not have been able to do it within the tight term. 
and then follow up with papers and other exercises online, making use of the technology we have, but also those periods that we have for intensive work. And this is very exciting. Haji Schreffler up here in the front is the person who's in charge of that. Many of you have worked with her. Still, we knew that some of our students would never make it abroad during their time at Drexel. And for them not to have that experience of engaging was really a huge loss. And so we created the Global Classrooms. We have to this day had over 50 Global Classrooms, reaching almost 2,000 students both in the United States and abroad. Bringing, connecting a class here at Drexel with a class abroad, um, using our online, plat uh, our online platforms, various kinds of internet technologies, virtual spaces, for our students to do projects together in a wide range of subjects from biomedical engineering to Spanish and Chinese. So this is probably the, one of the most creative, uh, I think, initiatives we've had at Drexel, and one that's catching the attention of people across the globe. So Adam Zahn, who's in charge of that, has been invited to speak at The Hague, not in the criminal court. <laughs> when I hear The Hague, that's all I think about, you know? But no, at a conference on the use of internet technologies uh, for global engagement. So he's very, we're very excited about the fact. And we've been applying for grants using this, and it's uh, in a great area. So I just want to mention one other thing that I think is particularly important, and that is the Global Engagement Scholar Program. I'm not sure that you know, most of you know about that, but um, the Global Engagement Scholar Program is a, an opportunity for our students who are engaged to bundle together their experiences, their study abroad, their co-op abroad, their classes that are globally themed, their language study, uh, organizational work here on campus, to bundle that together to create an online platform to share their ideas and present to others, and then to, to defend and present that portfolio at the end of their career here and get a designation on their transcript as a global engagement scholar. You know how important it is to have that, something like honors on your transcript. Well, now our students have the opportunity to have global engagement scholar on their transcript. And it's a great way of allowing them to reflect, to bring their materials together, but also to see the importance of the work they do with others. So um, these are so many of the things I want to mention. I also want to mention that we're always looking for funding and of course, funding for research is critical and we support faculty who are doing that. We have seed funding for faculty who want to build those re partnerships. And we're happy to write letters to show the support and logistical frameworks for people who are looking for global um, research dollars. At the same time, um, we are also looking for funding for scholarships. Scholarships make a huge difference. The study abroad has some money which it raises through its being a third party um, school, of record. school of record for other school for other universities and programs. But um, we have seen through the Dornsife Global in, uh, Development Scholars Program, where the Dornsife have given so generously for students to go to Africa to do collaborations with World Vision, that when students are funded, they really do go abroad and have incredible experiences. I mean, we were all crying the other night when the uh, five or six students were recounting to the Dornsites their experience. And uh, that program is so, uh, so enriching and so life-changing, but it also is important because it does provide access. So we're also looking for funding and reaching out um, to, to see that as an important part of our movement going forward. I think that's it. It's been a wonderful journey. Uh, we have uh, increased the number of students going abroad, the number of faculty visible. Um, of course, my mother is calling me. <laughs> she wants to hear about the progress as well. Uh, um, but, you know, uh, we want to make sure that people see that our numbers, our visibility, our, we are, I believe, having an impact globally when you see the work that our faculty are doing. Oh, I should mention that we have 
faculty lunch and learn where you can hear about and you can share your own research globally. We have a fantastic uh, research day in the spring where we celebrate all of the research that's going on uh, globally and give people a chance to share that um, and come together uh, over their research. Uh, and the numbers are growing exponentially. So we're very proud of that. And in case you're worried about the dangers of going abroad today, which unfortunately we're seeing uh, in places which we hadn't expected, um, we have now, we're one of the 80 universities in the country that has a designated person uh, for the university as a whole to support the health, safety, and security of our students and faculty. And we have registries for students and the faculty who go abroad and administrators and staff. Even our provost signed into it. We're very proud of him. So that we know at all times where people engaged with Drexel are so that we can reach out to them uh, and support them if indeed there are any events that um, uh, could be could be could be a, a coup. We had a faculty member in the attempted coup in Ankara. She slept through it. Okay, we knew exactly what was happening. Uh, or it could be an earthquake. We did not have any students in Amatrice in Italy, but we uh, we earlier had folks in Nepal. So all of this is important. We work closely with uh, risk management on this. That's Marsha Hennish, who is our designated person. She's here in front and uh, with the tax office now and other offices to be able to build in the important security aspects um, as we increase our global exposure. So I want to let people know that. Uh, most people don't think about that, but that's really critical. And of course, everyone who goes abroad in any way related to Drexel needs to sign in to the Grand Registry for Travel or through the Student Studio uh, Abroad. Um, and and it's, I think Drexel's really a leader in this, and we're very excited that um, we're among uh, that elite group of universities that does have a designated person and many of the mechanisms to keep um, people safe. Okay, so that's it. Let's have some questions. I hope that uh, this has sort of opened up some of the uh, uh, avenues for conversation. And uh, we have a mic out here. Uh, so anybody who has a question, please. Okay. I, I probably don't need a mic. So. Well, your mic is a big room. And we're streaming. Okay. Hi, I'm Sean O'Donnell. I'm from the uh, Bees Department, Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Science. Uh, I guess I have maybe more of a comment mm -hmm. than a question. And I'm going to preface it by saying that I'm going to pretend uh, in making this comment that we're not in a time of very tight resources. So obviously, you know, let's let that slide. Um, I guess my, my thoughts, you know, I, I'm in the process right now, uh, after uh, four years of, I would say, kind of struggle, I think getting close to being successful in developing a study abroad, standalone study abroad course during the fall uh, intercession, which I'm very excited about doing. Um, it's been a difficult process getting this to happen, and in many ways frustrating to me. Um, and part of the frustration is I've gotten this sense that uh, I almost kind of view growing, you know, you're, you're talking about growing study abroad and international engagement at Drexel. Uh, I think it's something that there's lots of room for improvement. I can see it in the process of improving. I also kind of feel like to some extent, it, I believe that if you build it, they will come. So I like to think that when I get this course finally off the ground, that it's going to fall and fail and students will be very excited about it and it'll run for many years. Um, I'd like, I guess I'd like to see Drexel do more to, if not at least, you know, if not even incentivize faculty to do this, at least not throw up impediments. <laughs> uh, it almost felt to me like the, process of deciding whether, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm putting in extra work, I'm doing this out of passion, I'm not getting any extra resources for doing it, it's obviously going to cost me a huge amount to do it. Uh, but I'm still excited about it, I'm still motivated to do it. Um, and yet, 
bringing all of that energy and excitement and desire to the table, I just have felt for four years until now like I've been prevented from doing it. And I guess what I'd like to see the university do uh, is reach a point where this process isn't so department specific. I guess I'm not a believer in states' rights. How about if I put it that way? <laughs> uh, you know, it, 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 I, I've heard say, I, and I have to say I don't have you know, direct evidence of this, but I've heard say from people that know, um, there are huge discrepancies among departments and programs and the kinds of resources they get. And then a lot of these decisions are left up to the department. And in my case, strangely in my opinion, that has worked against me. So you know, the Department of Biodiversity, Earth and Environmental Science didn't seem to be interested in having students go and do environmental science and study abroad. Okay, well, so you know, the, 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 I'd like, I guess I'd like to see Drexel move towards a more uniform approach to doing this and think about ways of incentivizing the faculty because I kind of feel like if we get more faculty on board, that's going to generate the opportunities and allow more students to get involved. And then hopefully, of course, it'll be a snowball effect. And then, I don't want to just sound like I'm complaining, <laughs> which I am, but I will say, having said all of that, if there's any way for me or other faculty to get involved in helping make that happen, please tap me, because I would be more than happy to participate in trying to help make, the, you know, either get the message across to higher administration. I'm not sure where the blockage is, but um, I'd like to see that aspect of this improve. That's where I'm coming from. Okay, so I didn't pay him, you know. <laughs> really. Uh, but absolutely, that is a key for us, and really a key also for President Fry, who has made it very clear that he does not want to hear about those blockages. So I'm very happy, and I will call upon you. Um, Provost Blake and I are meeting with the deans. We have appointments with, I'd say, half of the deans before, uh, before Christmas, um, and then we'll be meeting with others afterwards. We're going college by college, because you're absolutely right. Some colleges have embraced. I want to give a shout out to Alan Sabinson. Westfall is probably the best um, in terms of supporting, providing funds, and making it possible. And they have a very difficult <sighs> curriculum. So it's not that you know it's easier. Um, but uh, I think that what we're doing as we go to each dean is to say we don't want those impediments. We want to make sure that faculty who want to do this are supported, have the resources where possible, and we always have some, um, and are encouraged, not discouraged, for, from doing it. So it's really important to hear from you uh, because we're going to try to change that. Now, unfortunately, because of the tightness of budgets, sometimes you know our deans and our department heads are really feeling strained. And so when they hear about new programs, they think, oh my god, more, you know. But in fact, if we think about how, the, how important these kinds of programs are for recruitment and retention, in fact, a small amount of money could actually bring in many more resources. So 100%, thank you for that question. Yeah, Jim. Um, I wanted to build on, on that comment. Uh, the School of Biomedical Engineering is redoing its curriculum, undergraduate curriculum. And at the moment, there is a plan to set aside a full quarter for a global experience. <laughs> we would like to resurrect a program that we thought was successful that ran into issues, which is the We Serve program. So my question is very short. How are you going to help us? Okay, great. So actually, we have programs like we serve. We have a lot of service programs going on, um, and the students, in fact, biomed students are taking part in the Dornsife Global Development Scholars Program. Unfortunately, the Methodist organization that supported the we serve program, which I went to that wonderful hospital um, in Mozambique, they stopped funding. But the, Glo the Dornside Global Development Scholar Program is fantastic, and it has also resources. So that's certainly important, and we would love if we find other funders to promote other kinds of service collaborations as well. We also celebrate, uh, I should say, Biomed is, of course, one of the leaders in global innovation partnerships and has always sought partners for mutually beneficial research collaboration and now this idea of targeting a term is really a critical one and uh, we'll be using you as a model for others as well, so thank you. Yeah. 
Hi, Julie. I just I want to speak to this and then ask you a question. Um, mm -hmm. As somebody who just did a two-week course abroad in September, um, I had a great experience, right? And, and it can really vary, as you're saying. So I had to support a dean, support a department head. Uh, she allowed me to postpone one of my fall courses later into the year, so I was able to stay in Italy for six weeks after my course. We got a $1,500 fellowship to support, the, you know, keep the cost of the, of the thing down for the students. So I, I think it was really an optimum possibility, which everybody should aim for, definitely, you know, knowing that that's possible. Um, my question is, you know, we work very closely with, with a, what I think is a really good educational institution in Rome, the American University in Rome, and I know we also, uh, we use them for, for term long courses connected to sports management. Uh, they provide a classroom, they provide a residence, and, and so forth. Other, other than the four major initiatives, you know, that, that you spoke about, and I don't know to what extent those allow for joint degree, but I wanted to, you know, to what extent the possibility may exist to explore some joint degree programs with schools like AUR, or other ones in Paris, Berlin, Madrid, London, and so forth, which I think could really be mutually beneficial to us. Thanks for the ad. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, we're working on things called dual degrees. Joint degree, the term often means in some people's minds and uh, traditionally that there is a degree that has both a certificate or a diploma that has both universities' names on it. A dual one is where you actually get two degrees. It makes a little extra work, but they can be very um, can be very uh, uh, beneficial. So we have a dual PhD. Uh, with the Shanghai Chao Tang University in Biomed. We have a, a number of dual degrees also with engineering and we have a dual masters uh, with um, the Eagle, through the Eagles program with Poli Milano. So we do have some programs. They're complicated, but we can definitely work on them. It's definitely uh, something that we are, you know, if, uh, if you have an institution you think would be worthwhile, we can work on it and see you know, how that might work for the benefit of our students, and can we financially figure out a good model and a model that works in terms of credits, and, uh, but um, it, and sometimes is, it's easier when it's at the graduate level than the undergraduate, uh, but we can certainly look into it. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Rogelio Miñana. I'm the head of the new department of global studies and modern languages, and I just want to show up like make an announcement and ask a question. But the announcement is that the languages are working to uh, work with different schools to develop uh, courses that are target that are targeted or that are tailored to your students' needs. I'm thinking about bi biomed, for example, or or even these. Or, so we are open and we will be reaching out to different schools where we see potential for courses that would be, again, tailored to your students' needs. So please reach out to us as well. We might not think of your school or your department as a potential partner, but if you think there's enough student interest, we can definitely start a program for your students. We just started this with health uh, and Spanish. We're doing a new sequence of health Spanish for uh, nursing and health professions here on campus, but also for the School of Medicine in Queen Lake. Both classes are full, completely full. In medicine, we had 120 applicants for one class. Wow. Okay, So there is instead interest. Now, my question is, or my comment about uh, the situation of everything global at Drexel is that, as Julie was saying before, I mean, the, the, the job that you guys have done from the OIP is absolutely outstanding. So I'm, I'm like, I'm blown away by the, the kind of things that you're doing. But structurally, I think Drexel is not conducive to necessarily to study abroad or to languages, maybe because of the, the whole term versus semester thing with study abroad. But from a perspective of the languages, the problem is that many schools, many curricula are just not flexible enough. So what I keep hearing from advisors and students is students want to study languages, but they don't have time and they cannot take language until maybe their junior year or something. That's not, so we need to work on that. And I would really ask that every school, every department think about how they can make sure that there's room in their curricula for students to start semester, I mean, term one. Uh, they, they, they study language in, in high school. They don't want to forget, they don't want to miss that. They don't want to lose that. And, and 
for the other language skills. They want to continue. And if we get them early on, a language is the best window into the world. I mean, we can try to send students abroad, and we do it successfully, but if, they, if we send them out with language skills, their engagement with those programs and those colleagues and those partners abroad is going to be so much richer and stronger. So again, please uh, reach out to me if you have needs in your department for language courses. We're very happy to work with you and also work with your colleagues and associate deans and so on to try to make room in your curricula for language. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Jose Diaz. I'm a nursing student uh, in Drexel University. I'm actually a freshman, and I'm actually very interested in nursing abroad. Um, I'm here, I think, um, I want to speak to you guys as a student, as a freshman. In my perspective, um, two months ago, I came to Drexel University in Philadelphia. Um, as a freshman, I'm scared. I'm scared because this is new to me. Uh, actually, about three months ago, I lived in a town called Galway, New York. And Galway, New York is a population size of 4,000. My graduating class was 63. Um, so for me, this is scary. Um, this is scary to come here. Um, just in Philadelphia, it's, it's foreign. Um, I think your resources, uh, your resources, your commitment to study abroad um, is not only for you guys as faculty, but also for students. Um, and as a student myself, it's, I had to reach out to, uh, to, to come here. Um, I think um, you can use students as resources to, to help study abroad. You can, um, you can reach out to students, social media. Uh, nowadays, I, uh, I think uh, my mind is a lot uh, mature than my body. I'm 19 years old but I, I feel like an adult. And all the students around me, they're playing on their phones and they can't even talk to me. Uh, you know, so like for me, I think the best way to, to really expand this program is to really reach out to the students and uh, through social media, through things that they like doing, and also convince them, they're scared too, convince them that you don't have to be scared to study abroad. Uh, there are resources out there, help them, and they will be your resource. Um, they can, if you can motivate them, if you convince them that studying abroad not only will be good for them, um, but will be good for everyone, in, including people abroad, um, then it will definitely expand, um, I, I don't know, uh, it will definitely expand this program and, and especially uh, the students' interest in studying abroad. Uh, at Drexel, I know the schedule is different and weird, but you can tell students that uh, it, it can definitely uh, be incorporated into their um, schedule. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And I'm just going to show you, can we stand up the study abroad people here, team? Okay. Come talk to us. <laughs> so they, they have done exactly what you suggested. They've created a group of students. They're called the Dragon ambassadors, you know, and they're reaching out, they're working with students. We also have the Student Global Advisory Board, uh, which also is trying to, you know, find out how to get the students, how to, can, you know, to talk to them about their, their concerns and about opportunities. So thank you so much. See these folks here? Make sure when we break now for lunch that um, you meet one of them and talk to them and see how you can help us and how they can help you. Thank you very much for your comments. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Drew here, assistant clinical professor in the accounting department. I'm going to answer your question. One of my students from accounting 115 is going to London uh, in January. Kuping is, uh, well, I, was, I had the honor of giving her a recommendation letter, and uh, I think she'll be a good addition. She, she has her visa clearance, and she's all set, so it's all, all systems go. So I just want to say it does work, and I don't know how she found out about it, but I know she approached me because I had actually worked in London for Deloitte former graduate, and I actually could say um, I became friends with one of the, the gentlemen who did co-op, uh, who actually I met while I was over in uh, London through the office, and I recently visited the, I keep getting mixed up, the FIE office over there, yeah. 
that over London. So there is opportunities, and I'm more familiar with London, so I can speak to that. So um, I just want to at least let you know that there is going on. And, and again, I apologize if this question has been asked about this because I had to run up. I had a student taking a test upstairs. I'm on the ninth floor. But um, I recently rejoined uh, the British American Business Council. And when I got Jane Rosen, I think I got she used to be there before. He came back, Jane Rosenberg, because I know her from before. And I, and I mentioned how I wanted to join as a member. She said, oh, well, Drexel used to be a corporate member. So anyway, she, you can imagine, she said, well, just go talk to somebody. Well, I haven't had a chance to do that yet, so here I have the opportunity. Uh, so she, I put my half in. If I put her half in, we're actually be a corporate member again. So I would have to share that. But, I, it gave, but the reason I bring that up, not so much for the group, but I wonder about how big of a net we've already probably cast not simply by what you're doing, by bringing all the groups together for this international. You're also, uh, there may be, we may have contacts in other organizations. I joined the BABC years ago, and I'll rejoin it because I did work in London, and I wanted to keep the connection up with my time in England. But I'm just saying there may be other organizations out there as well, and I don't know who's like maybe collecting that database or looking, but maybe that's something you're already doing. So my thought is there could be, if, if, if we continue to keep working, it sounds like you're already moving well ahead of doing, is uh, maybe there's a, a database or a, a, if we put our contacts together, we can find we really are connected in many different ways. Thank you. Thanks so much, and that's a great point. Uh, Drexel is on the board. I, I serve on the board of the uh, World Trade Center of Global Philadelphia, and uh, Lebeau is a funder of that. Um, we're also on uh, the Global Philly Association Board, which is a great portal for knowing what's happening in Philadelphia. Um, and we are connected to many of the chambers of commerce uh, um, and so on and try to uh, 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 bring that information to the folks on campus when there are events, uh, as well as, for instance, some of the consulates and the consular corps. So, for instance, we do a lot with the Italian consul general, Ciao Philadelphia is a big celebration that we're a main player in, and we will be very involved and we're involved in the designation of Philadelphia as a World Heritage City. So um, we'll continue to do that. But that's important to know, and it's good. And anytime you have a question about that, if it's on our website, you can check it out with me. Um, let's see, other questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, you got the mic, so you're first. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniel Christie, I'm a senior at BSMS in Mechanical Engineering. And I'll have to say, Julie, I didn't realize that you existed until the last couple of months, but I'm very glad you do. <laughs> so, so one strategy. Oh. And so one strategy that I found to be very successful to deploy uh, global initiatives that work is to partner with the private sector, particularly big, large multinationals. Uh, so I've been doing some work in the last year with uh, Elsevier, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, scientific publisher in the world, to deploy game-based learning in context of the National Academy of Engineering grand challenges. So far, we've impacted about 4,000 students in 550 plus universities worldwide, and we're looking this year, in the winter and the spring term, to prototype new, and new experiences that take the engagement to an even higher level, to, to, re, to deploy it, to prototype it at Drexel locally, and deploy it globally. Fabulous! That's <laughs> very exciting. Great. Yes, it's been, it's been an exciting opportunity to do this global work. And I think Drexel can really be a leader in the space, part, leveraging all the resources we have already on this campus. I think you're absolutely right, and I think it's really exciting what we can do together the more we share our information like that. Congratulations. That's very exciting. Let's put that up on the website. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Hausman. I'm from the Drexel English Language Center, and um, I have more of a comment and a pitch more than a question. But a lot of you may know that we do a lot of great work supporting our international students here on campus. Um, if you have any questions about that, please come see me. I'd, I'd love to talk to you more about that. But we also do other things for students who are interested in uh, teaching or doing an assistantship abroad after graduation, uh, particularly with Fulbright. Um, so we do um, a lot of cultural and sort of teacher um, sort of preparation to help students, you know, when after they've graduated, so not quite study abroad, but um, to continue their global experience after Drexel. So yes, please come talk to me if you have any questions about that. Great, thank you. And of course we have folks from the uh, fellowships office, so 
We're really excited to see, have our students apply for fellowships to go abroad. And I'm going to take your last question because we have lunch back there. I want to make sure everybody gets something to eat. Um, and then you can continue talking to one another and to any of the folks who are part of the global team. Yeah. Hi, Julie. Thank you. First, my name is Dylan. Um, I'm from Turkey. I'm a PhD student in material science engineering, and, I, and I'm a third year student. And I have actually experienced the benefits of study abroad from a very young age. When I was 17 years old, I was partaking in a program called American Field Services, or AFS. Mm -hmm. And I had the chance to go to Germany for one year, and it really changed my life um, as a whole. I mean, it just opened my world. I was able to, you know, explore, and like I was more brave about going outside of my, you know, comfort zone, and basically just improve myself. And you know, here I am, a PhD student, um, you know, in the United States. Um, but uh, you know, I, and I would like to just do this again and again because it's just a taste that once you get that study abroad, you know, you just don't want to leave it. And you know, <laughs> when I was in college, for example, in Turkey, I again, you know, I participated in the study abroad program from my own university and had the chance to come to UC Berkeley for one year and also, you know. Um, had my junior education there, um, and I would like to do this for my PhD as well. So you know, and, and I'm looking for opportunities to basically you know um, take part in the Drexel's you know study abroad programs. But you know, whenever I talk to my advisors or in general you know the, the people in my faculty, you know, just because I'm an international student, they always say that it's kind of harder for me to kind of partake in these you know um, programs because of the visa issues and. Uh, and, and maybe, I, and I think that you know it, it shouldn't be an issue, and I'm sure there are ways to go, go around it. But it's just the professors and the advisors are not very well informed about that, and they always try to, you know, kind of encourage it. And I'm hoping that there will be a voice that will be heard, and it will be easier for international students to also engage in these kind of programs. Thank you. Thanks, and you know that's a really important point. Um, all students can take part. And sometimes graduate students, I thought you were going to say, you know, your PhD advisor didn't want to let you out of the lab, you know. And, and, and that Kara Spiller from Biomed is actually conducting a subgroup of our Council of International Programs on how we can, you know, work with faculty to encourage um, uh, graduate students to go abroad and how we can do that at the same time by creating collaborations in labs so that it works it is a benefit to the faculty as opposed to, you know, sort of an obstacle. But um, it, it, many of our international students study abroad. The fact that you're here and matriculated here actually makes it easier sometimes for you to get your visa. So we certainly will support you in, you know, uh, uh, in trying to study abroad. One of the things that you brought up is that sometimes, you know, we all get a little bit of misinformation from well-meaning colleagues and friends. And if somebody tells you you can't do something, make sure that you come see our study abroad folks or me. Because, you know, sometimes that is what people heard, or that's what happened three years ago, or maybe five years ago, or whatever. But we're generally in the business of trying to find where somebody says no, we say yes. Oh, wait a minute. Where someone says goes low. <laughs> anyway, you know the rest. Um, I, I promise not to be political today. Um, but anyway, we do try to be creative. We're really in the business of lemonade here. So when we see somebody, you know, brings a lemon, we think it's, you know, we can find the positive solution. So um, we don't have a lot of money. We're not going to be able. We do have some. Um, but we can often look to find some opportunities or piece things together. Cost sharing is always the best way to go, and you need to have someone who can start that. So please come talk to us. Anyone who gets that sort of, well, I don't, I don't know that you can do this, let's talk together about what we can do. And um, thank you all for coming. Please get something to eat in the back. And um, I look forward to many, many more of these kinds of forums. Thank you.